right, welcome to the 1130 service where we don't care about the clock. Amen. Visitors, don't be nervous. We'll have you out of here by 3 o'clock, all right? Let's stand together as we reverence the reading of his word. Are you blessed to be in the assembly? Yes. I was joking about the 3 o'clock. I got to have some grilled chicken before then for sure. This might be your first service. This is my third along with others. Blessed to be in a new series this morning called Pulling Down Strongholds. This will be a continuation of the teaching we've been in over the last few months. But before we get into it, as you turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 10, can we celebrate the 48 that were baptized here this past Wednesday? Amen. We are just over three months into the year. Uh, here we are in the first week of April, and we've baptized this year 148 believers. So to God be the glory for what he's doing, amen. We just give him all the praise, amen. 2 Corinthians chapter number 10. We're going to begin here. This will be the foundation for this series that we'll probably be in for the next few weeks or so. If you're taking notes... This is a transitional message that will connect us to the series we just finished on addressing the issues where we talked about insecurity and expectations. If I had to subtitle today's message, it would be pulling down insecurities, pulling down insecurities. And we're going to talk about how to fight today. Come on, somebody. All right, more on that here in a minute. If you're in 2 Corinthians 10, say amen. amen, and we'll look at it in verse number 3. Matter of fact, I'll read verse 3, 4, and 5, and then I'll pray, and you can be seated. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. We tend to want to fight the flesh and folk, but that's not where the real battle is. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal or fleshy but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations, images, visions, ideas, worldviews, and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God. So when I have an image, a vision, a thought, a worldview that's not in line with God's word, I'm supposed to cast that thing down. And bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ, verse 6, and having in a readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled, which means the enemy may be tempting you to hate. And he's saying, hate, 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 hate. Go to work and hate, hate, hate. And you got hate and you're struggling with hate. You're like, I'm not going to hate. I'm not going to hate. In the name of Jesus, I'm not going to hate. Well, the way you really overcome that is you walk in love. Did that make sense? I don't know if that made sense. I got to come up with another one. So you feel on your heart to give, and, and, and the thought is give, give. I'm going to buy somebody's lunch. Give, 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 give. And, and, and that's your thought, but the enemy comes behind and says, can't afford it, can't afford it, can't afford it, can't afford it, can't afford it. They don't deserve it, they don't deserve it, they don't deserve it. And you're struggling. You say, one day I'm going to be a giver. No, no, no. If it ain't but $2, give something right now. See, I'm, I'm, on, I'm going to revenge that thought that told me not to, not to love with love. I'm going to revenge that thought that told me not to give with giving. In other words, I'm not just going to be neutral and say I won. No, I'm going to do the opposite. Amen? Well, maybe, maybe we'll get a better amen in a little bit. Let's pray, all right? Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the ministry of your Holy Spirit. And I pray right now for all who would be under the sound of my voice. For those here in our Shreveport and Bossier campuses, for those watching this live stream or telecast, I ask that you would bless our hearing and that by your Holy Spirit, we would receive revelation knowledge, that you would give us wisdom and spiritual understanding, that Father, by your Spirit, we would walk out of here today with a conviction of truth, words of hope, faith, and salvation. I ask, Father, that you would speak through me the words that you would have spoken. Override what I've said in the previous two services. Override my premeditated and studied thought. And may your Holy Spirit speak by me in this moment the words that you would have spoken. I ask that you would make my tongue the pen of a ready, alert, and sensitive writer that I could write on the hearts and minds of these, your people, 
your anointed word that removes our burdens and destroys our yokes forever as we boldly declare that Satan is defeated. We are redeemed and Jesus is Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. If you would, greet two or three people around you before you take your seats. Make them feel welcome. Now look at your neighbor and say, let's get into it. Now listen, I got y'all came to the 11.30 service. Welcome to the 11.30 service. At 8 and 9.45, I needed a little more time to really do what I wanted to do, and I couldn't do it because we had to get the folk out so y'all could come in. But would you give me an extra minute today? Huh? Come on, somebody. You came to 11.30 for a reason. I know you did. Don't worry. I can only go so long, and I got to go find me some grilled chicken. But, 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 but give me a minute, all right? I want to get everything out. Today, we're going to talk about pulling down insecurities. Pulling down insecurities. Can you say that out loud? Pulling down insecurities. And today, we're going to study David. David. We're going to look at David, King David. But we're not going to start when he was king. We're going to look all the way back into the, while he was but a shepherd. And so we'll let David be our example because if there's anybody in the Bible that ought to be insecure, it should be David when you consider all that he went through. And so I love looking at examples in Scripture of what I'm dealing with because if I can look at an example in Scripture of what I'm dealing with, it makes the Word of God to me more relatable. And I realize that all of these heroes of the faith that are written in Scripture were casual individuals just like me, and they face drama just like me. And if they can pull what they pull from the Lord, I can pull what I need to pull for from, from the Lord. Amen? Amen? Hallelujah. So let's dig into it. First of all, I want to establish a stronghold and understand what it is, because that'll be the topic for the next few weeks. So we'll look here in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, and we'll start in verse number 3 of 2 Corinthians chapter number 10. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. You got to trust God in his word this morning. Because he just said here that even though we walk in this flesh, and man is a triune being, made in the image of a triune God, man is a spirit, lives in a body, and possesses a soul, a will, or an intellect. And so we have to recognize the way we're made. And though we walk in the flesh, though we walk in this physical, natural body, our warfare is not after the flesh. We tend to think it is, and we're going to talk a little bit today about fighting, because there's so many fights and wars that are going on in our world, and we've got to begin to recognize that the real enemy, most of the time, is enemy. Enemy. And in most cases, when we have issue, the issue, help me, church, is you. And I'm not saying that to be cute. I'm saying that to be real because it's biblical, and I'm going to show it to you here in just a moment. He said, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. That's not my battle. The enemy would love for me to make you my battle, but that's not my battle. My battle is not with the flesh. Verse 4 is going to tell you what it is. For the weapons of our warfare... The weapons of our warfare are not carnal. There, there are battles you can't win in the flesh, but they are mighty through God to the pulling down of what? Strongholds, strongholds. And we're going to be talking about strongholds over the next few weeks. Today, not a whole lot on this verse, but we will be covering it more in the coming weeks, Lord willing. If you wanted to pull up a, a title or a word or a study that would fit a biblical stronghold that shows up in today's culture, in our topics of discussion and study, the word would be confirmation bias. And a confirmation bias is defined partially as this. It is people's tendency to process information by looking for or interpreting information that is consistent with their existing beliefs. 
which means if I walk in a confirmation bias or in a stronghold, I am looking for things in other people that support my existing ideology, my existing worldview, what I already thought about you. There's probably not many strongholds more powerful than that of racism. That's a very strong hold that many people have. When you would look at a person and think that you could sum them up simply because of the color of their skin, that is a strong hold. And sadly, society shapes us in most cases from childhood all the way up to be able to prejudge someone we don't even know by what they look like. And so we have this idea that the world has given us through its narrative that X people are such a way and Y people are such a way and Z people are such a way. And so when we come across a Z person that's not such a way, we ignore that because that doesn't support the, the, the ideology that we grew up that Z people are this and Y people are this and X people are this. But the enemy is a liar and the narrative of this world is not always true. And we have to be willing to recognize maybe this ideology or this belief system that I have is not accurate and I need to stop viewing the world through my lens of a stronghold where I've made all men to be this. I've made all women to be this. I've made all, hey, preachers to be that. Or all churches to be this. Or all Christians to be that. Or all Baptists to be this way. And all Methodists to be this way. And if you're Catholic, then you're this way. And if you're a Democrat, you're that. And if you're a Republican, you're that. And we're bad about putting people in these categorized categories that our ideology has told us that if they're in that description, then they are such. Are y'all with me? And sadly what we do when that happens is we're looking for more bricks to establish our stronghold that support my existing belief. So if I have an existing belief about you, I'm going to ignore anything in you that would cause me to rethink that and I'm only going to pull from you what supports that existing belief. Does that make sense? Do you see how that could create insecurity? Hey, that's not all, folks. Look at this. For though we walk in the flesh, verse 3, we do not war after the flesh. Now, this is going to be a hard pill to swallow, but it's biblical. As a matter of fact, if you want to put a bookmark here in 2 Corinthians 10 and come over with me to the book of James, I want to show it to you, the book of James. Now, in the previous two services, I referenced this verse, but we didn't turn there. But you came to the 1130 service, so you're going to give me time to go ahead and turn there, all right? Aren't you? Yeah, y'all, yeah, so nice. Watch this. James chapter 4, I want to look at it in verse 1. What if my fight with you was really a fight with me? What if what I don't like about you is really what I don't like about me? Y'all going to help me make a case in the Word today? We're going to study David here in just a minute. But I want to show you something here. I was, I was processing this this week, and I felt like the Lord had put this Word in my heart, but I don't want to say something that's not biblical. And the Holy Spirit reminded me of this verse. You can find out a lot about people by the questions they ask you. That's a nice jacket. How much you pay for that? See, that, 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 that's none of my business what he paid for that jacket. I should have left it at, that's a nice jacket. That's a clean blazer, man. You make that look good. So that should have been left right there. But if I'm trying to get into his financial business because I'm insecure about mine, then I start asking questions that I shouldn't be asking. How much you pay for that? Why do we have to make it about money? Why couldn't it be about you like the jacket? How do you not know the jacket wasn't given to him? You can tell by people's questions where their security lies. I hear what I'm saying to you. So watch this in James 4. We'll look at it in verse 10. Or verse 1. Verse 1. James 4 verse 1. From whence come wars and fightings among you? Where does this come from? Why do we fight? Why do we have war? From whence cometh wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence even of your lust that war in your members or in your flesh? Your own body? 
In other words, the reason for the fight and the reason for the war is something in you has prompted this. Something in you. And the reason why this is so important is because if I have a stronghold that, that's causing me to prejudge you, if I have a stronghold that's not allowing me to live in harmony with my community or in my church, if, if I've got a stronghold in my mind and the issue really is in me, I need to know that's there so that I can deal with it. And I want to show you that David, you know, uh, 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 throughout his life was known, with, with, was known for his battles, but yet, this man that's known for his battles was a man that was frequently met with mocking that would have only uh, created more insecurity in his life. This is going to all come together. Uh, trust me, all right? Just stay with me here. So he says, from whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence even of your own lust that war in your members? Now this word members is not talking about the members of the church. It's talking about members of your flesh, your body. My eyes want to see this. My ears want to hear this. My mouth wants to taste this. I want to feel this. I want to experience this. So it's, it's dealing with the flesh of our own uh, 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 expectations and passions. Are y'all with me? So look at what he says in verse 2. You lust, but you have not. So then you what? You kill and desire to have, and you cannot obtain. You fight and war, guess what? Yet you have not. So you're fighting and you're, you're combative, but, but you still don't have anything that you say you were fighting for. And then he goes on to say, it's because you ask not. Now, with this in mind, I want to come back to 2 Samuel chapter number 5. And so let's ask ourselves the questions that we turn there. Is, what I, is the thing I don't like about you, could it be the thing I don't like about me? Could your life make me rethink me? Come on, somebody. I can't meet somebody of a different skin color. And they not be what the narrative told me they are. Boy, y'all quiet. Y'all trying to find second Samuel? It's after first Samuel. <laughs> See, I don't want to have to change my view. I don't want to have to change my view. I don't want to change my view of what I was told, you know, about X people. Miss Kim. So if I go to church with you and I find out all I've been hearing about you is not true and all you've been hearing about me is not true, then I might have to, I might have to deal with me. And it was easier for me to deal with you instead it is to deal with me. Come on, somebody. Am I right about Miss Ken? Amen. So folks will say, uh, uh, what you doing now? Well, you know, why, 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 are you, why, why are you going to that church? Why are you going to that church? Well, could it be you want to go to that church? And now you're wearing me out for going to that church because I've had to overcome some stuff to be a part of this church because you can't be, you, you can't be prejudiced for long coming here. You don't mind me saying this to you, do Miss Kim. You, y'all hear what I'm saying to you? So now I got to address the reality. You know what? All X people aren't a certain way and all Y people aren't a certain way. Maybe we got more in common than we got different. And maybe if I hang out and have some community, I'll find that out. And instead of fighting you, I realize, wow, we work better together. I'm taking my time, I'm taking my time, I'm taking my time. Are we more concerned about protecting our stronghold and what we think about people than, 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 than we are of saying, wait a minute, maybe I'm not right about this. Maybe my view of, of church is not right. Maybe my view of man is not right. Maybe my view of God is not right. Maybe my view of the Bible wasn't right. Maybe there's something in me I need to deal with and it's not everybody else and maybe it's me. Because insecurity gives birth to the wrong expectation because we tend to expect from people what we need to satisfy our own insecurity. But not a one of us should be held hostage by somebody else's insecurity. Are you in, in wherever was I told you to go? All right, let's, let's, let's look at the text here. Second Samuel 5. This is going to be where David is anointed as king of Israel. This will be the third time David is anointed. Now, this is important. Because under this anointing here in 2 Samuel 5, he's about to become king of Israel. Not just Judah, all of Israel, the north and the south. 
And not only is he going to become king of Israel, he's going to take Israel's capital, Jerusalem, that the enemy had been holding. The enemy, the Jebusites in 2 Samuel chapter 5, had possessed Jerusalem, and they even called it their stronghold. Are y'all with me? So this stronghold in 2 Samuel 5 is going to be the physical picture of the topic that we're on right now. Y'all with me? So we're dealing with strongholds in the mind. But we're going to look at the physical example of a stronghold in the Bible that the Jebusites had that David was going to take. The Jebusites were not a strong people, but they held a strong place. Let me say it another way. The Jebusites were not a strong people, but they maintained a strong position. Sometimes the thing that exercises power over us is not that it has power within itself. It's that the, it, we gave it the position of power. Weak people need strong positions to exercise strength. In other words, I can have something in my mind that completely takes over my life, but yet it of itself has no power. But the reason that it has power is that I put it in the position of the control panel of my mind. It's not what other people think about you that will stop you. It's what you think about you that will stop you. There is nothing more powerful in your life than your own thought. So if I have strongholds in my mind, it does not matter how powerful they are. They can be weak. But once I put them at the, at the, at the, at the, at the steering wheel, once I put them in the control panel, now because of their position, they have power, not because they have individual power. Hate doesn't have that much power. It's when I allow it to control my mind. Fear doesn't have that much power. It's when I allow it to control my mind. It reminds me of a story I once heard a long time ago about a little boy that looked out his window and he saw other kids playing in the park and kicking the ball and he had braces on his legs and would never go out and play so one day his dad walked in his bedroom and he said son today we're going to church and we're going to go down to that altar and we're going to pray and today you're going to be healed so the little boy couldn't wait to get to church and sure enough at the end of the service they went down to the altar and prayed that day when he got home from church, the boy went out and played, went out and kicked the ball and had a good time with his friends, something he had never done before, but he still had the braces on his legs. When he came back in the house, he asked his daddy, he said, Daddy, how come before I couldn't play like I did today? His daddy looked back and said, Son, it was not the braces on your legs that stopped you. It was the braces on your brain. It was, it was those on your mind that held you back. Those are strongholds, insecurities that tell me I can't have that job. I should not apply for that college. I can't be anything else. I'll never come out of this neighborhood. I'll never be anything. I'll never have a position. It's the insecurities that keep us in bondage. And if anybody had a lot of reason to never be anything, it was David. Because from the time that he was a teenager, he was mocked. David is going to break generational strongholds. And I'm declaring in the name of Jesus that we are going to break generational strongholds. What I mean by a generational stronghold is that's a stronghold that I didn't start. It started with my daddy or maybe my grandfather or, or a stronghold that started with my mom or my grandmother. And this stronghold has been passed on generation after generation after generation. And somebody's got to rise up and say, I'm going to break this cycle. I'll be the first one to graduate high school. I'll be the first one in this family to do this. I'll be the first one in this family to do this. Whatever that is that needs to be broken, why not you? Why not you be the one to break a cycle? of a generational curse that's been in your life. See, the Jebusites, when you study their history, they had never won a battle. Their strength was their position. They had Jerusalem. They had the high place. They looked bigger than they were. They had the mountain. They had the top. They had the crescendo. And they looked down at everybody because every other city in Israel was below them but they were squatters. They didn't even belong there because these are the descendants of the Canaanites that God had already judged. And so now David is anointed king and he said, we're going to take, take this city 
Because it's the city that, that belongs as the capital of Israel. It's the place the temple is to be built. This city is God's city, and we're going to take it. And notice what they said to him in light of that. Second Samuel chapter 5, let's read the text, beginning in verse 1. Then came all the tribes of Israel to David unto Hebron, and spake, saying, Behold, we are thy bone and thy flesh. Also in time past, when Saul was king over us, thou was he that led us out and brought us in Israel. And the Lord said unto thee, thou shalt feed my people Israel, and thou shalt be a captain over Israel. So all the elders of Israel came to the king in Hebron, and King David made a league with them in Hebron before the Lord. And they anointed, and they anointed, and they anointed David king, not just over Judah, but over all of Israel. Now, at the age, somewhere between the ages of 12 and 19, he had already been anointed by the prophet Samuel that one day, you know, he would be king and that he had the anointing to be king. At this point, we're about to read, he's 30 years old. So we know at least 11 years have passed. But when he takes this position of king, he'll be there 40 years. Don't worry about how long it takes you to get somewhere. God's more concerned about the longevity when you get there. You might be trying to rush down the altar and get married. It's more important that when you get married, it lasts. Well, y'all going to do me like that. I'll tell you what, y'all rough on me today. Don't worry about the position and how quick you get there. God's concerned about the longevity when you get there. And God knew when he anointed David as a little boy, as a teenage boy, that there was coming a day when he would be king over all Israel. But that season was appointed. It had to come after David had been through some things and was ready for that seat. Well, this is that moment, and he's ready now to take that seat. And they anointed him. Verse 4 says, and David was 30 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 40 years. In Hebron, he reigned over Judah seven years and six months, and in Jerusalem, he reigned 30 and three years over all Israel and Judah. And the king and his men went to Jerusalem unto the Jebusites, the inhabitants of the land, which spake unto David, saying, Except thou take away the blind and the lame, thou shalt not come in hither, thinking thinking David cannot come in hither. Read that last statement out loud. Thinking David cannot come hither. So they mocked David. They up here in the high place in Jerusalem. And they're looking down at David and say, you, you couldn't get past the lame and the blind to take us. You will never take this stronghold. And we find later in the chapter that that's exactly what this was. It was a stronghold. And so the Jebusites looked down and sent word to David, you'll never take this stronghold. You'll never take it. They mocked him. But this didn't phase David. Because David was used to being mocked. Woo! In 1 Samuel 16, God comes through Samuel. And he says, I want you to go to the house of Jesse. And I want you to anoint one of his sons to be king. So Samuel went to the house of Jesse to anoint one of his sons to be king. When he got there, Jesse had seven boys lined up. And they were tall, strong, and good looking. And God told uh, Samuel, don't look on their countenance. Don't worry about what they look like. Because man looks on the outward appearance, but God is looking on the heart. So don't ignore what they look like. And so when Samuel went through all seven, God's spirit said, nope, rejected, 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 rejected. He said, wait a minute. Are you sure all your boys are here? And just said, no, I got one more boy, but he's in the back 40 out here. He's watching the shit out back. He said, go get him. I won't sit on your sofa till you bring him to me. So David comes in as a teenage boy who had just been, you could say, uh, uh, mocked by his father that didn't let him come to the inauguration, not even to witness his brother be anointed by, by Samuel the prophet to be king. He don't even get to be there. 
Do you think about the insecurity that David could have had that his own daddy didn't bring him in to meet the prophet to see if he might be the one? That could have done some serious damage and some scarring in David's life. Where, wait a minute, you, you, my own daddy, my own daddy wouldn't invite me. That would lead him later in life to say things like this. When my mother and father forsook me, the Lord lifted me up. See, God took that evil that could have been used to, to bring about insecurity. He used it to help David and shape David. God has a way of letting our feelings get hurt while we are young. so that we don't act like a baby when we grow up. So David ends up getting the anointed to be king. And then one day, next chapter, 1 Samuel 17, David's daddy comes to him. Y'all got a minute? David's daddy comes to him and he says, hey, David, Send, take this bread down to your brothers. They're fighting. They're fighting the Philistines. I want you to go down and give them this bread. They need some nourishment. So David had to leave the sheep, go take the bread down to his brothers. When he got down there, his brothers were in a trench. Now, if you want to make your enemy look bigger, you just get in a three-foot trench. So they're down in a trench looking up at, 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 at Goliath fighting. Now, he's already nine feet, but he looks 12 when they're three foot down. Come on, somebody. Quit making your enemy bigger than he is. And David come walking up, and the Bible said they were hid in a trench. And they said, what are you doing down here? Oh, you, you, your heart is naughty. You're not right. Where are your sheep? Where are those little few sheep of yours? They mocked David. But wait a minute. David came down there for them. And now they're mocking David about where are your sheep? But wait a minute, you, do they really have a problem with David or do they have a problem with themselves? Because they're the ones not fighting. I want you to think about this. Why are they so angry at David? David asked the question, is there not a cause? Is there not a reason to fight? And they said, you get on home to your few sheep. Why? We don't want to hear that because David, you're making us rethink us. Are y'all with me? So they mocked him. And David then asked the question. He said, this is all in 1 Samuel 17. David then asked the question. He said, what happens to the man that beats this giant? And then Saul stepped in the king. And he says, son, this man's been fighting longer than you've been alive. You better get on home. So he's mocked again. Mocked by his daddy, don't get invited. Mocked by his brothers, what you doing out here? Where you little sheep? Mocked by the king, this man's been fighting longer than you've been alive. Can you see the reason why this man might, uh, might should be insecure? He's been told all his life that he can't be nothing and he shouldn't be there and he'll never do anything and he'll never be anything. There's a reason why David should be completely insecure. He tells Saul, he says, Saul, when I was watching sheep, a lion came upon my flock, and one of my lambs got, got taken by the lion in his mouth, and I saved the lamb from the lion's mouth, and I killed the lion. I love this. It's, it, it, we we kind of lose it in Scripture. It's so powerful, though. Y'all don't mind me doing a little storytelling, huh? It's all biblical. Because what David was able to do was David was able to fight without killing what he was fighting for. I'm trying to show you that even out there in the, in the field with the sheep, God is preparing David to, to how to fight and when to fight. And so if he kills the, the, the lion in such a way that the lamb loses its life, he, he, has, he has killed what he was fighting for. And I feel like there are so many times we kill what we're fighting for. I've seen churches split over a fight when people say, oh, no, I'm fighting for my church. No, you should have left. That was not a battle that could have been won. 
and what you're doing is you're killing what you were fighting for. I wonder how many married couples divorced and went their separate ways. And if you ask either one of them, they say, well, I just fought for my marriage. I fought for my marriage. I fought for my marriage until I couldn't fight anymore. Well, maybe you killed what you were fighting for. Oh, y'all want to be like this. How many boys have been discouraged and their hearts and spirits broken by their dads? And then later you talk to the father and he said, well, I was just fighting for my son. But you killed what you were fighting for. You've got to learn how to fight and recognize what it is that you're fighting for. And don't fight the wrong enemy. He said a bear came too. And I slew him in the name of the Lord. So I said, all right, then, take my, take my uniform and put it on and go fight him. And David said, no, if that uniform would work, why don't you fight him in it? I got to go with what I used against the lion. I got to go with what I used against the bear. I got to go with what I have security in. And what I've got security in is in the name of the Lord. And so he goes out to fight Goliath. Stay with me. Are you seeing the progression? I want you to see the progression of David. Because nothing is telling him you can do this. So he goes out to fight Goliath. And guess what Goliath does? He said, what, am I a dog that you came out against me with a stick? And he not only mocked David, he mocked David, his people, and his God. So let's get it in order. He was mocked by his brothers, or his father. Mocked by his brothers. Mocked by the king, Saul. Mocked by Goliath. So then, after he defeats Goliath, 1 Samuel 17, he, he comes back in, and the women and the people were all gathered after the fight. And Saul come walking in, the king. And they said, Saul hath killed his thousands. And then David walked in. And they said, David hath killed his ten thousands. Now, you think Saul wanted to hear that? No. So then in the house, we know that an evil spirit filled Saul. He had lost the anointing to be king even though he was still in the seat. God hadn't removed him from the seat yet. But in 1 Samuel 15, God said, you can't be my king because you listen to people instead of me. And that's when in the next chapter he anointed David to be king. David knows he has the anointing to be king, but he's not in the seat yet. Saul is. Come on now. Saul is in the seat, but he don't have the anointing to be there. And anytime you're in a seat you're not anointed to be in, it'll drive you crazy. Because Saul went nuts. So when David came in the door, Saul grabs his javelin and he throws it at David. But who is he really fighting? Does he really dislike David that much? Or is he upset that he only killed thousands and David killed ten thousands? That demon really is right here. But guess what David didn't do? He didn't reach back in his bag and grab another rock. You got to know when to fight. And know when to dodge a fight. This fight ain't worth having. This, even, though da, even though Saul tried to kill David, if David retaliates and kills the king, he could be executed. This ain't the way to do this. So David in humility says, I know what I got to do. I got to fight that demon you saw. So he breaks out his harp and he begins to praise. Oh, somebody. And the Bible said the evil spirit left Saul. But David never fought him. As a matter of fact, at one point, when Saul was trying to kill David, David was hid in a cave. And Saul went in that cave, the Bible said, to relieve himself. He must have been carrying too much. And while he was relieving himself, David came in behind him, grabbed his robe, and took his knife and got a piece of it off. Later, he came to Saul and asked forgiveness and said, 
forgive me that I touch you because God's word says touch not my anointed and even though Saul had lost the anointing he was still in the seat and as long as he was in the seat David was supposed to respect and honor that seat and David said I have disrespected and honored that seat when he showed Saul the cloth letting him know I could have already killed you but I didn't why? Because even though he was anointed to take the seat, Saul was already in the seat, and the anointing can't fight the anointing. Because the house divided will fall. David knows when to fight. He knows when not to fight. By the time we get to 2 Samuel 5, Saul has taken his own life. He fell on a sword. Saul's not in the equation anymore. It's David's time. And so David says, we got to take Jerusalem, the stronghold of the Jebusites. But when he gets there, they mock him. I was mocked when I was a teenager. I was mocked by my daddy. I was mocked by my brothers. I was mocked by king. I was mocked by Goliath, but I still am who I am. Are you seeing what I'm saying to you? He didn't let the mocking bring about an insecurity. He was able to reach deep within himself and recognize where the true demons were, and he defeated the inner demons, which allowed him to defeat his external enemies because he defeated his internal enemies first. David had every reason to be insecure, but he's not. He's going to take the city. Church, he's going to take the city and then name it the city of David. You ain't hearing me. So let me just speak this over your life. One day you will name what others mocked you having. You need to receive that. One day you will name what others mocked you having. He was mocked that he could never take the stronghold of Jerusalem. The Jebusites sat on that land. They had possessed that land. They inhabited that land. They said, you, you, couldn't, you, couldn't, you couldn't get past our blind and our lame if you wanted to take this land. But David found a way up through their water system, and he took the land of Jerusalem and was anointed king over all of Israel. David said, I call this this, the city of David. It was called, it was named by him. He named what he was mocked ever having. You name something when you have authority over it. Now, I love what happens in the next chapter. So let's finish this one so we can look at it, all right, because this thing will bless you. So we'll look in verse 7. Read it out loud with me, verse 7, Shreveport Bowes, you ready to read? Nevertheless, David took the stronghold of Zion. The same is the city of David. Let's read that out loud. Nevertheless, David took the stronghold of Zion. The same is the city of David. He took the stronghold. He took the stronghold. He took the stronghold. He took the stronghold. When you take the stronghold, when you take the stronghold, that's when you win. When you take the stronghold, that's when you win. The enemy all of our lives tries to build these strongholds. In so many cases, they're generational where I've inherited this thought. I've inherited inherited this worldview. I've inherited this belief system. It's a stronghold. It, 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 it's holding my whole life captive. I'm viewing everybody and everything through the lens of this stronghold. And that stronghold is preventing me from taking what God has for me. And in order for me to take what God has for me, I have to defeat this stronghold. But the true stronghold, biblically, what we've read in 2 Corinthians 10, is not out here. It's in here. And when David took it, he named the city after his own name. Now, come on with me one chapter. Nothing has power until it controls your thought life. I wonder how many of us are allowed, allowing the Jebusites to sit in our minds and control. Lord willing, in this series, we're going to talk about fear. 
But I want you to know this. We don't technically have to live in an absence of fear because that's not reality. But what we can do is live in the presence of courage because courage is only needed in the presence of fear. Courage says fear won't stop me. Mm -mm -mm. That's courage. Now watch this with me in 2 Samuel chapter 6. You get there, say amen. So now David has Jerusalem. And he said, you know what? We got to take the Ark of the Covenant from Obed-Edom's house where it had been stored. And we got to take it where it belongs to Jerusalem where the temple, the temple was in Jerusalem. And so they go to dedicate the Ark of the Covenant and take it to where it belongs in Jerusalem. And watch what David does. We'll read verse number 14. And David danced before the Lord with all his might, and David was girded with a linen ephod. And as they brought the Ark of the Covenant into Jerusalem, which would embody the presence of God, David began to celebrate. Why? Because the Ark of the Covenant the seat of the presence of God was about to be where the stronghold was. And isn't that what I need in my life? I need the Lord to sit behind the control panel. I need his word to have the final authority, not my stronghold. And so David is celebrating because that stronghold had fallen and God had given him the triumph and the victory. So he is celebrating. But he doesn't have on his gold crown. He's not wearing his kingly garment. No, he's down to his ephod. Down to his ephod. And he is praising God and celebrating what the Lord has done. Verse 15, so David and all his house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouting and with the sound of the trumpet. And as the ark of the Lord came into the city of David, Michal, Saul's daughter, David's wife, looked through a window and saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord. Read the rest out loud. And she despised him in her heart. She looked through a window. There's David down there celebrating Jesus. And she had a, a despise. And the Bible says that when David came home, verse 20, then David returned to bless his household, and Michal, the daughter of Saul, came out to meet David. And she said, how glorious was the king of Israel today who uncovered himself today in the eyes of the handmaids and servants as one of his vain fellows shamelessly uncovered himself. She mocked him. She said, the only reason you praise the Lord is for the maid servants. The only reason you praise the Lord is because of all your vain fellow servants. Let me say it to you another way. She just does all that to be seen. She ought to stop singing so loud. He ought to put his hands down. You say, who says that? I said that. I was at an inter-fellowship, an interdenominational fellowship, right after I got saved. And I was standing next to a girl in an inter-fellowship of many churches, and she threw her hands up. And I was right next to her. And I was like, she ought to put her hands down, drawing all this attention. It was because the church I went to, you didn't raise your hands. It wasn't that I disliked her. It was that she exposed the freedom I didn't have. It didn't hit me till one day I'm watching Emmett Smith break the rushing record and score touchdowns, who was my favorite player back in the day, number 22. And I'm jumping around my, mother, my mother's living room, Brother Jefferson, and the Holy Spirit said, you'll do this for Emmett Smith. And immediately I thought back to the girl that was praising Jesus that I accused of just doing that to be seen. And I said, not again. There ain't no rock crying out in my place. If I can shout for Emmett Smith, I can shout for Jesus. Hey! So Mikhail came and said, David, you do all this to be seen? You got to see David's response. See, there has to come a time in our life when our actions are not <laughs> manipulated, 
by others mocking you. Because just because you've reached the pinnacle of your life won't stop folk from mocking you. Because you would think at this point David would be sitting on his throne and say, finally, whoo, finally, long journey here. Mocked by my daddy, mocked by my brothers, mocked by the king, mocked by my enemy, mocked by my other enemy. Finally, them days are over. Nope. He came home one day and his wife said, I can't believe it. You're going to go out there with your linen ephod and shamelessly praise the Lord. You've got to see what David said and we'll be done here in a minute. We'll go eat that grilled chicken I was talking about. And David said unto Michal, verse 21, it was before the Lord which shows me before thy father. See, 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 Michal is Saul's daughter. The, the marriage got arranged when he defeated Goliath. And she might have had this thought. You wouldn't have been nowhere were it not for my daddy. My daddy gave you me. My daddy gave you this kingdom. My daddy put you in this house. Look what, look, what, look what David doing. He said, look, I need you to know the Lord chose me. Look at, look at, look at, look at, look at, look at the word. Which, look, he said, the Lord, I, I did this before the Lord, which chose me before thy father, before what I knew what it was like to eat bread at a king's table, before what I knew what it was like to wear a fresh set of clothes every day. Because you may remember when David first came in the house, he didn't even have a set he, he of clothes. When David was invited to Saul's house through his friend Jonathan, he didn't even have a clean set of clothes. And Jonathan went in his closet, this is all in the Bible, and he brought him some clothes. He brought him some clothes. Hey, hey, hey. I know y'all ready to go. I'll be done in a minute. He, he brought him, he, hey, glory to God, there's a word in this. Uh, Jonathan brought, Jonathan is the son of the king. Jonathan is the heir of the throne. David ain't never worn nothing nice. And Jonathan brought him his garment out of his own closet. And when David put it on, the Bible said, if, Lord, help me, Jesus. If, if, if hey, help me, Lord. If it. You know where you belong because it'll fit. It shouldn't even fit. What are the chances two young men wear the same size clothes? It fit. Being in the kingdom fit. Ooh, 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 glory to God. Ain't never worn nothing like this, but it fit. Before that day, the prophet came. The same one that anointed Saul. And he anointed David. And David said, Michal, I need you to know this. Before your daddy. Before your daddy called me. He called me. Saul didn't make me who I am. Saul didn't make me who I am. Your daddy didn't make me who I am. That job didn't make me who I am. That title didn't make me who I am. This suit didn't make me who I am. He called me before your daddy knew me. And now that he's fulfilled his promise in my life, you think I got some kind of shame in taking off that? You think I got some kind of shame? I will praise the Lord with nothing, with nothing. Because I had nothing when he called me. I was in the back watching sheep. I missed the inauguration. I wasn't even supposed to be here.
David said, you're not going to mock my praise. Where my handkerchief at? I don't need the suit. I need my rag. Tell the enemy, you're not going to mock my praise. I've been mocked all my life. I've been told all my life what I'd never have. I've been told all my life what I'd never be. I've only been reminded of my mistakes. I've only been reminded of my past. I've only been reminded of my failures. And I've been mocked all my life. But the Lord called me before man knew me. The Lord called me before man knew me. You got to know that today. That the Lord called you before man knew you. What does that mean? That means your security comes from him. So if I strip down to my undergarment and praise him, I won't be mocked because in him I live and move and have my very being. If my praise bothers you, there must be something wrong with you, but I ain't going to let it be what's wrong with me. Church, we got to overcome our insecurities. Who told you not to apply for that job? Who told you you couldn't apply for that scholarship? Who told you you couldn't attend that college? Who told you you couldn't have that job? Who told you you couldn't marry and be successful in marriage even after you had only known generational break brokenness through marriage? Who told you that you couldn't raise your children even though your father wasn't there to raise you? Who told you you had to bear the curses of your past? Who told you that a generational curse was going to hold you up all the rest of your life and that your grandpa wasn't nothing and your daddy wasn't nothing and you ain't going to ever be nothing? Who intimidated you? Who tried to take away your security? Who tried to tell you you'd never be anything? King David was familiar with being mocked, but yet Jesus was called the son of David. Jesus was called the son of David. Don't tell me what God can't do. Let's pray this morning. Every head bowed, all eyes closed, let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray over those filled with insecurity. With every head bowed, would you just before the Lord in your heart acknowledge your insecurity? Low self esteem. fear let the weak say I'm strong let the weak let the weak say I'm strong Besides mock David, they said you'll never take the stronghold. And I'm declaring in the name of Jesus that whatever strongholds we have in our minds, they will come down in the name of Jesus. In the presence of God, we'll be seated. Where our strongholds once sit. Don't let fear talk you out of your future. Don't 
Don't let insecurity cause you to miss what God has for you. Ignore the mocking of the enemy. If God be for you, who can be against you? You don't have to prove anything. Rest in his name. Rest in his word. He loves you. I invite you to pray this prayer with me. Heavenly Father, I acknowledge the insecurities in my life. And I ask in the name of Jesus, that you would pull down every stronghold. Strongholds from my history. Things in my past. That cloud my vision. of what you're wanting to do in my life right now and the plans you have for my future. Bring these strongholds down. Be Lord of my life, mind, body, and spirit. I believe you died for me through a perfect love and that your perfect love cast out my fears. I believe you raised Jesus from the dead. that I could walk out my purpose in this life with the hope of eternal life. And I believe you have saved me. You have called me to salvation. And I believe you have called me to a purpose. And I ask, If there's something in my mind, a stronghold that tells me I can't live out that purpose, that you would pull it down. Right now, I believe whom the Son makes free is free indeed. So just as you did, David, give me the courage to overcome the mocking, to overcome my mind and my past, to walk out the destiny that you have for me. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Can we give the Lord a hand clap offering for his word this morning? Man. All right, listen, let's stand together. If you need prayer on either one of our campuses, we have altar ministers down front. Just come forward. Let one of these altar ministers pray with you. Otherwise, you can be dismissed. Look forward to seeing you here on Wednesday, 6.30 p.m. as we continue to talk about grace. I love you. Have a blessed week.